Chapter 16, Vector Calculus, Section 16.1, Vector Fields. The db set in R2, a plane region. A vector field in R on R2 is a function f that assigns to each point x, y, and d a two-dimensional vector f of x, y. Since f of x, y is a two-dimensional vector, we can write it in terms of its component functions, p and q, as follows, where f of x, y is equal to uh, some function p of x, y, i, plus q of x, y, j, which we can write as p of x, y, comma, q of x, y, where we use these little uh, braces. So uh, notice that f is a vector function, p and q are scalar functions. So because they're scalar functions of two variables, we sometimes call them scalar fields to distinguish them from vector fields. So you can see that in our little picture on the right, we have some point x, y, and then we have the corresponding vector f of x, y, where we just draw that from the point. So we draw the points and the vectors together. And we do that for every single, um, well, not every single vector in the vector field, but a bunch of vectors in the vector field so we can get a good picture of what it would look like. Let E be a subset of R3. A vector field in R3 is a function f that assigns to each point x, y, z, and E a three-dimensional vector f of x, y, z. So it's pretty much the same thing. We just draw the arrows in 3D space instead. We can also express vector fields uh, on R3 in terms of their component functions. We just you know, throw in an R for the k component. So how about we do an example? We have a vector field in R2 defined by f of x, y equals minus y, i plus x, j. We'll describe f by sketching some of the vectors. So how about we make a little table? So we can say that here's the point x, y, and then here's the uh, corresponding vector in our vector field. So how about we throw in, say, minus 1, 0. Sorry, I mean. 1, 0, then we get 0, 1. Because notice that we take minus the y value, that becomes the first component, so we get minus 0, which is 0, and then we get uh, the x value for j. So that's just the 1. So let's see if we could plot this. I'll draw some x and y axes. And 1, 0 would be right over here. So I put the point over here was the point uh, 1, 0, and then I do the vector. So this is f of 1, 0. And I can keep going like this. How about I do 2, 2? So then that's the point minus 2, 2. So I'll put the point 2, 2 in, let's say over here, and then I'll draw the corresponding vector, which is basically that. So this is f of 2, 2. So I've got two vectors in my vector field now. How about we do uh, another one? How about we do uh, 3, 0? So that would become 0, 3. So I'll count, let's see, over here's 2, let's see, over here's 3. So there's 3, 0. Then it doesn't go left to right, it just goes up 3. So something like this. And we just keep going like this. So we should get something like this for our vector field. So notice that all of our vectors seem like they should be tangent to some circle that we draw around. Like if I look at uh, these vectors over here, it seems like I should be able to draw a circle and these vectors should all be tangent over here also. So we could probably verify that by letting x be the vector xi plus yj. 
So this is just the vector that corresponds to any point um, x, y. So if I put a point over here, for example, oops, sorry. If I put a point, uh, let's say over here, then this is the vector that points to it. So that means that this thing is basically the radius of a circle. So to see that our vectors in our vector field would be perpendicular to the radius, we could take the dot product. So I'll take x dotted with f of x, which is equal to xi plus yj dotted with minus yi plus xj. And notice that that's minus xy plus yx, which is zero. So that means that what I could do is I could take a circle and I could draw, um, oops, I try to draw it a little bit better. So that all of the vectors in our vector field will be perpendicular to some circle. I could draw another one like, well, maybe not as easily. I'll just leave the one in the middle. You get the general idea though. We could also see that the length of f of x, y, that magnitude is equal to the square root of minus y squared plus x squared. So that's the same thing as saying it's the square root of x squared plus y squared which is also the length of x, the magnitude of x. So our vectors in our vector field are just as far away from the, or the, their distance, the vectors in the vector field, are exactly the same as the length of the radius of the circle that corresponds to them, which should make sense because notice that these vectors are much longer and you need a much bigger circle in order to draw it so that they are tangent to it. Let's now try sketching the vector field on R3 given by f of x, y, z equals z, k. So we'll need some 3D space now. Notice that in the, each of these cases, the vector field just points either up or down in the k direction because the k component is just equal to the z value and we have 0i and 0j, so it doesn't move left or right. So, um, for example, if I were to plug in a point over here, let's say 1, 1 for y and z, then I'm just plugging in 1 for z, so it just goes up 1. But anywhere where z is 1, it doesn't matter what x and y are, when they get the same vector that points up 1. So at all of these points, I just get a vector that points up one. Then notice if I were to go up a little bit more, then the vector will point up a little bit more because the vector points up the z value. So if I go up two, it'll point up uh, twice as long. And if I were to go, let's say, below the uh, z equals zero plane, the xy plane, then I have a bunch of negative z values, so all of these guys will point down. Eh, it didn't come out so well, but that's okay. How about I try just doing one more row? Hmm. 
Okay, so that's our vector field. Notice that we had a very simple vector field just equal to z. Most vector fields are more complicated and they'll require calculators to draw. So we'll just be able to make rough sketches using a calculator. Imagine a fluid flowing steadily along a pipe and let v of x, y, z be the velocity vector at a point x, y, z. Then v assigns a vector to each point x, y, z in a certain domain E, the interior of the pipe, and so v is a vector field in R3 called a velocity field. Let's sketch a possible velocity field in a fluid flow. So how about I make some sort of pipe? So I'll try drawing that in 3D. And what I'll do is I'll make it come out a little bit and uh, try expanding a little bit to make the pipe a little interesting. So how about like something like this for a pipe? Okay, and I'll put this in the XYZ plane, so I'll draw a Z axis. So something like this. Okay, now we need a velocity field, so it should, the fluid you can imagine going into the pipe should flow along the pipe, so I could have arrows that go like this. However, I made the pipe a little bit wide. You can't see it, but this, fair, this arrow kind of pokes out towards you to fill up the, um, with the pipe, the radius of the pipe, so. How about I try drawing some more arrows to show you? It kind of, the fluid kind of moves to fill the space in the pipe. Okay, how about we now talk about Newton's law of gravitation? It states the magnitude of the gravitational force between two objects with masses little m and big M is um, the length of f equal to mmg over r squared, where r is the distance between the objects with masses m and m. g is the gravitational constant. So let's assume that the object with mass big M is located at the origin in R3. Let the position vector of the object with mass little m be x equals xyz. How about we write and sketch an equation for the gravitational field f. So pretend that the object with mass big M is, let's say, the Earth. So it's located at the origin. Then we've got some other object with mass little m that's being pulled towards the Earth via gravity. So because we have x equal to x, y, z, and that's floating out somewhere, we have our Earth at the origin. The distance between them is r, but the distance from x to the Earth is the distance from x to the origin, so that's just the magnitude. So all we have to do is get the magnitude of x, and that'll be our radius. So that means that our magnitude squared is our radius squared, so I can throw that in for r squared. Okay, let's see if we can build f now. So f will be the length of f times the unit vector version the unit vector that points in that direction. So notice that if x is the vector that points at a point and it's being drawn in towards the Earth via gravity, then I should just reverse that. So I'll look at uh, minus x. However, I need a unit vector version if I'm going to scale by f, so I'll divide that by its length. Plugging in, we get that this is just what we're given by Newton's law of gravitation. So that's minus m m g because I'm taking this minus over r squared, but r squared is the length of x squared, and then I have another length of x, so I've got the length of x cubed. And I still have my x. So this is f written in terms of vectors. But what if I wanted to write it in terms of its components? 
notice we said the components of x are x, y, and z scalars. So we could write x as xi plus yj plus zk. So that means that the length of x could be written as the square root of each of those components squared x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So that means that I could rewrite, if I wanted to, the vector field f of x, y, z in terms of the components x, y, z by writing that it's minus m, m, g times the first component x in here, then divided by the length, where the length is We'll have to take the length in cubit actually, so this is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. I take the square root, so I put it to the half power, and then I cube it, so it's going to be the 3 halves power, and that's our ith component. And then if I want the j, it's pretty much the same thing, except that I have a y in the numerator. And I'll still have the same denominator for all of these guys, x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. So that's our jth component, and for our kth component, we just have minus mmgz over x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. Okay, let's give a rough sketch of this. So we have our x, y, and z axis, and we want these gravitational vectors to point towards our Earth in the center. So how about I draw a drawing, stuff like this, and you can get this from the equation, but it's kind of hard, so you probably want to use a calculator to actually get like a better picture but we get a whole bunch of vectors that point in like this. Notice that our vectors are the longest, they have the greatest magnitude when we're closest to the object in the center with mass big M, because that's when gravity is pulling on it the strongest, whereas as we get farther away, our vectors get smaller in length because gravity has less of an effect on it. Suppose an electric charge Q is located at the origin. According to Coulomb's law, the magnitude of the electric force F exerted by this charge on a charge Q located at a point x, y, z with position vector x equals x, y, z is the length of F equal to epsilon Q Q over R squared, where epsilon is a constant that depends on the units used. This vector field and the one in example 4 are examples of force fields. So the gravitational field we just drew is an example of a force field. Instead of considering the electric force F, physicists often consider the force per unit charge E, which is 1 over Q times F, called the electric field of Q. Let's write equations for F and E. So first for F, it'll be pretty much the same as before. We build F by multiplying by the unit vector so that we just scale it. So we take the length, epsilon, hmm. Q, big Q, over the length of x cubed times x, because we have a unit vector that's either pointing away or towards the origin. But notice I didn't put a minus sign, because I'll allow it to be determining whether we point away or towards the origin, or towards whatever point we're pointing to, based on this value over here, Q times Q. So we'll say that if we have like charges, then that'll imply that uh, Q times Q, the two charges have the same signs, so they're both positive, they're either both negative, in which case they're positive, or they're both positive, in which case multiplying that makes them positive. And that means that our force is called a uh, repulsive, because it means that our vector points outwards in the positive direction, so it's repelling away. If they have unlike charges, it 
then that means that QQ will be negative because one of them is negative, one of them is positive. So in that case, we call the force uh, attractive because it's pointing in like in our gravitational field. Okay, let's write equations for let's write an equation for E now. So that's pretty easy because it's just basically the equation for F, but we multiply it by one over Q. So we basically just lose the Q because we get one over Q times F and we're just dividing by Q so it cancels it. So we just have epsilon Q over length of x cubed times x. If f is a scalar function of two variables, its gradient, del f what, x, y, which is equal to the partial derivative of f with respect to x with the i component and the partial derivative of f with respect to y for the j component, is a vector field in R2 called a gradient vector field. So this is just a vector field we make where every single vector is just a gradient. We just throw the partial derivatives at each of those points in there. So if f is a scalar function to variables, its gradient is a vector field in R3, and we just throw in the partial with respect to z. So let's try finding the gradient vector field of f of xy equals x squared y minus y cubed. And then we'll plot it together with a contour map and see how they're related. So we'll take the gradient of f of x, y, and that's just going to be partial of f with respect to x for i component plus partial of f with respect to y for a j component. And fortunately, this is two-dimensional, I don't have to worry about k, so we get 2xy for the partial f with respect to x, and then we get x squared minus 3y squared for the partial with respect to y. So let's try uh, plotting this vector field. So you might want to use a calculator or something, but just give you a rough sketch, something like this. Just put in a bunch of the vectors. You should get something like that for the vector field. So now let's plot the uh, plot a contour map. So I'll use another color for that. Uh, so we'll do this. Remember, we're taking f of x, y, and we're setting that equal to constant values of k. And then we see what we get. So doing that for a whole bunch of different constant values of k, we get just a bunch of level curves. This is for one value. And then some other value. Just keep doing more and more constant k values. And you should get something like that. Remember to use negative and positive values for k. So it, from what we see, it looks like all of our gradient vectors are perpendicular to our level curves, which is exactly what we'd expect as we've seen before. So we could write that for one relationship. Gradient vectors are perpendicular to level curves. And then we can also notice that our gradient vectors are longer over here at the ends when our level curves are closer together. So we can write that too. Gradient vectors are long where level curves are close.
and that it should make sense because remember the length of the gradient vector is the value of the directional derivative of f. So closely spaced level curves would indicate a very steep graph, which means that you get a longer gradient because you have a bigger directional derivative. Okay, let's end by discussing a quick definition. The vector field f is called a conservative vector field if it is the gradient of some scalar function. So we can be given a, fu a function and say, okay, take the gradient and then make the vector field out of it. But what if we're given a vector field already? We plot it. We wanted to know, hey, did this come from some other function by taking the gradient? So in that case, if it did, we call it a conservative vector field, and we call that original function that it was the gradient of a potential function for f.